One of the most, how do I describe it? Terrifying, life-threatening situations I've ever been in was teaching my oldest child how to drive. If you've never had the privilege of doing that, you are missing out on some fun. When she was about, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, she was learning how to drive. We would drive from our house to the ballet studio. Me and her baby sister, who was three and a half years younger. And so it was only about a mile and a half. But I'm telling you, that was a mile and a half that was absolutely precarious. It was crazy. And we would get in the car and I would be in the passenger seat there in the front seat. And my daughter, I'm not gonna say her name because I don't wanna embarrass Nicole in front of people here. But she would be there driving and she's going down the road. And all of a sudden she's like turning into the curb. I'm like, no, stop, what are you doing? And she'd stop, no, don't stop. You gotta speed up, don't stop. There's a light, there's a car. And then in the back seat, my youngest daughter Claire is going, dad, she's gonna kill us. And I'm like, I know that, but be quiet. And I am raising my voice. I'm yelling at both my kids like I've never yelled in my entire life and since then. Crazy teaching your kid how to drive an automobile. Now, of course, both my daughters today are fantastic drivers, so uh, they have finally learned to, uh, to do that. But learning to drive is not easy. I remember when I learned to drive, my family and I had just moved to Houston. So we came from small towns and small cities to this metropolis of Houston. And I love Houston. I, I, am, I am pro Houston. I should be on the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, Houston is a fantastic city. It's a wonderful city. It is one of the most friendliest big cities in the entire world, except when you get on the freeway. It's game on, right? That is when our worst self somehow comes out. And you gotta be careful. If you think you're gonna be aggressive, if you think you're gonna be a bad boy or a bad girl, people carry guns here and they mean it. But learning to drive in Houston was kind of crazy. And, and the car that I had to learn to drive in was a used Cherokee Jeep, that, uh, a used Cherokee Chief Jeep. Obviously that car would not work today for several reasons, but it was a piece of junk. I mean, just to start that thing, you had to kind of jimmy it a little bit and do it the right way to get the automobile running. And many times you'd go to start it and it would shock you, literally shock you. Wasn't a great car, okay? But one of the things I remember about that vehicle the most was the fact that you would go down the road, you'd have your, you know, your hands there on the steering wheel, you know, 10 and two as you're learning. And it didn't matter what you do with that, with that car, it's always gonna go it's just gonna swerve, swerve to the right. And you take it in, try to get it fixed. There you go, a few weeks later, swerve to the right. Obviously, this problem of this car, this old car, was it had a major alignment problem, right? And it doesn't matter if you have an old used car or a brand new car or a sports car, eventually, your car is gonna get out of an alignment. How, how do you know your car needs an alignment? Well, there are three signs that your car may need an alignment. First of all, the steering wheel. It starts to shake, right? <laughs> you're trying to drive it. All of a sudden, you feel like you're driving an 18-wheeler. So if your steering wheel starts to shake a little bit, chances are you need an alignment. Another sign is, if you look outside and you look at your tires and your tires are starting to wear unevenly, it's another sign you need an alignment. But of course, a telltale sign that you need an alignment is what was happening to my old car when I was learning to drive. And that is, you swerve. You try to make a straight line as you're going down the street, going down the highway, but because your car needs an alignment, you swerve. And most cars are designed actually to swerve to the right. But as you know, sometimes you can actually swerve to the left. And when you swerve to the left and cross those two yellow lines, you've got a problem. And basically, if you ignore your alignment, when you're out of alignment, you place yourself, right, and others in grave danger. Alignment. Alignment's not just a problem 
we have with our cars, is it? Alignment is a perennial problem. It's a perennial issue. Right now in our nation, we have alignment problems, don't we? We can't get an alignment between the federal government and the local government, between state governors and mayors and all congressmen. Everybody has become an expert, right? Everybody's a scientist now, whether you're on the right or the left, and we do not have a consistent alignment, an agreement. And therefore, as a country, we're shaking and we're swerving and we're not living evenly, if you would, alignment issues. We see alignment issues, obviously, in relationships and marriage and family and raising kids. When things are out of alignment, you can begin to swerve, you can begin to drift. We see alignment issues in business, don't you? When you have people in your company or people who work for you and you're not on the same page, you don't have the same vision, the same values, then you're out of alignment. And when you're out of alignment, it causes chaos and confusion and disunity. Alignment. It's critical that we understand issues of alignment at home, at work, at school, and obviously, most importantly, with our relationship with God. So how do you know, as you look at your life, that things in your life may be out of alignment? How do you know that? How do you check on that? You can check three things. First of all, you can check your conscience. What is your conscience telling you? Because when you're living out of alignment, your conscience is gonna speak to you, it's gonna speak to me and say, hey, you're out of line. So listen to your conscience. Also, you need to check your regrets. Check your regrets. As you look back in the past, as you look back to last week, what do you feel bad about? What do you regret? Your regrets may show you that you have an alignment issue. Also, your emotions. Are your emotions kind of on the extreme, or, or do you find yourself becoming too angry, too worried, too afraid, too worried? Emotions are natural, right? It's a part of being a human. But when they're on that extreme, it's a sign that you might have an alignment issue. Alignment. When we're out of a line, with God, when we're out of a line with ourself, it affects every aspect of our life. What does that look like? What does it sound like when someone's out of alignment? Let me read you a quote by a leader I really respect. Here's the way he described what it feels like to be out of alignment. He said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Of course, some of you who've been to church before know who said that. That was said by Paul. Paul was a guy who had a radical conversion to Christianity. He became a leader. He became a writer. He was an entrepreneur in a sense. He was a guy who had a passion to follow God. He wanted to align his life with God. He wanted to show others how to live in alignment with God and harmony with others and yet Paul, this beast of a Christian, if you would, this guy who was full out and full on, had major alignment issues. He looked at his actions, he looked at his thoughts, and they were in disagreement. He looked at his desire to follow God and the way he was tracking in this moment, and things were not working out the way he planned. He was living out of alignment. And when you live out of alignment, man, we're vulnerable. We don't make good decisions when we're living out of alignment. Have you noticed that? When we're out of alignment, there's that gnawing sense of guilt. There's that gnawing sense of shame that something's wrong because we're not living in alignment. Paul described that so well, doesn't he, in Romans chapter seven. And I don't know about you, that kind of makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. 
it makes me feel good to know that I'm not the only one. It makes me feel good to know that someone like Paul, who was an absolute spiritual giant, also struggled with issues of alignment. So the question I've been asking myself this past week, the question I wanna ask you here today is very simple, and that is, are you living in alignment? Are you living in alignment? Alignment is something that's puzzled us for, for thousands of years. You can go back to Socrates, and Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. How do we live the examined life? We ask question upon question upon question. His student Plato believed that there was a realm that existed outside of the material natural realm where there was perfect alignment. And the way we live the good life, according to Plato, was to try to find an alignment with things here on earth that matched the alignment in that different realm. The Stoics, who were key uh, philosophical power brokers during the time of Christ and Paul believed that there was an alignment, a perfect alignment that existed outside of space and time that was also inside of us that we need to get our lives aligned with. Check out what they called this alignment. They called this alignment logos. And we know obviously that God has designed us to live in alignment with him and his purposes. That's what he's created you. That's what he's created me to do. And so life runs better. Life runs smoother. We can go down the road of life, if you would, in a better way, a more productive way, a way that will honor him when we are in alignment. Now, the past several weeks, I've been watching that um, the documentary on ESPN called The Last Dance. It's about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. How many of you have been watching that, that uh, documentary? Yeah, we have a few basketball fans in here. Incredible story, Michael Jordan, uh, an incredible athlete, one of the best athletes of all time. But what's interesting is you look at Mike, as you look at Michael as a professional athlete, he's a guy that lived in perfect alignment. When he was drafted by this horrible team, the Chicago Bulls, he thought to himself, I want to win a championship. Then he verbally said, I am going to bring a championship to the city of Chicago. And then his actions, by his actions, he said, hey, I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to do what it takes. I'm going to gather a team. I'm going to be mean to my teammates because he wanted to win. And I'm going to make us and bring us a championship to Chicago. And it took him years to do it, but that's what he did. They raised the banner, and they were the world champs, and I've heard rumor that they won up to six championships. Is that correct? Why? Because Michael, as an athlete and as a leader, was living in alignment with his thoughts, his words, and his actions. What does it mean to be in alignment? What does it mean to be in alignment? It means that we adjust things in our life so that they are what? aligned, <laughs> so they are lined up, so they are connected in a way that makes things work. Going back to the car, not that I'm a mechanic or anything like that, but when you get your car in to go for an alignment, it's not simply that they're rotating your tires. It's not really a tire problem. What they have to do is, is to adjust the suspension. The suspension, my understanding, is the system that connects um, your tires to, uh, to the road. And so when you change the suspension, when you adjust the suspension, it changes the angle by which the tires hit the road and it allows the tire and your car to move in a straight line. I don't think you can really see the suspension of your car unless you look under it, right? It's an internal issue, but it has an external result. All these things that are going on inside of our mind today, these align the issues as our conscious, our emotions are speaking to us. These are internal issues. But when you make an inner decision, this inner decision of an alignment should have external results. It should affect the way we live. It should affect the way we feel. It should affect the way we do life when things are lined up. 
<laughs> when I've aligned my life with God and his purposes and priorities for my life and for this world. That's alignment. So maybe, maybe the problems that you're dealing with right now, is, is, maybe the big problem is not that you are trying to simultaneously run a school and a business in your home or apartment right now. Maybe that's not the big problem. Maybe the problem is not the uncertainty and the chaos caused by COVID. Maybe the problem is not the fact that you have your in-laws or your adult children living with you on top of you right now. Maybe that's not the problem. Then again, maybe it is. No, maybe that's not the problem. Maybe the problem is a problem of alignment. It's an alignment issue. I'm not aligned with God and his purposes and his will, and therefore I see things in a very skewed and chaotic way, and that's why I'm swerving, and that's why I'm, my emotions are out of whack, and that's why my conscience is telling me that I'm not living the way I should, I'm supposed to live. Are you living in alignment? I believe God's word is telling us here today that it's time to align. It's time to align. If you're watching right now at home or if you're here in the worship center wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, let's say that together. One, two, three. It's time to align. Come on, put down your coffee, speak through the mask. Let's say it again. It's time to align. That's what I want to do. I want to align my life, my heart, my actions, my relationship, my vocation with the plans and purposes of God. Look, let's listen to what old Paul said. Remember Paul was struggling in Romans 7? Things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, I end up doing. What in the heck is wrong with me? It's my translation. Let's hear what he says in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, maybe the best, most powerful chapter in all the Bible. Pretty big statement. Romans 8, 5, he says this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. And what the flesh desires is simply pleasure chasing. If you're just chasing pleasure in your life, again, there's nothing wrong with pleasure, but if you're chasing pleasure as ultimate meaning, it's not gonna lead you anywhere. You're out of alignment. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit or in alignment with the Spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh, pleasure seeking, is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Man, I want life and peace. I want confidence and courage. I wanna know that in, in the midst of difficult circumstances that God is still with me and that God still has a plan for my life. And the way I do that, according to Paul, is alignment. I've gotta get aligned with what God and his spirit wants to do in my life and in this world. Someone asked Jesus many years ago in Matthew chapter 22, they said, Jesus, out of the five million laws that are in the Old Testament, including don't mix cotton with polyester, which is an important one, out of all those millions and millions of laws, what's the most important law? What should I focus on, Jesus? And Jesus said, simply, alignment. That's what he said. What should I focus on? What's the most important thing in life? Jesus said alignment. Alignment looks like love God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and flowing out of that alignment with God, you will love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. There's power in alignment to get what you think and what you say and what you do in agreement. So they can be in line. So you, your life, your wheels can hit the road properly. It's time to align. And when you think about it, the whole big story, the meta narrative of the Bible is one of alignment. In Genesis chapter one in creation, there's chaos, there's darkness brooding over the surface of the earth and God speaks alignment and light and life into the darkness. 
In Genesis 3, you have the fall. You have Adam and Eve making a misstep. You have misalignment. We're no longer aligned with God. Nature is no longer aligned with God. You have misalignment. When Christ comes, you have a realignment. He comes, he dies, dies, he rises again, that we can be realigned with God. And now we're waiting for the future. We're waiting for perfect alignment, this merger between the finite realm and the infinite realm, between heaven and earth, when we will live in no more tears and no more pain and no more hurt and no more sorrow and no more COVID and nothing like that at all. There will simply be joy. There will be bliss. There will be harmony in perfect alignment in the new heavens and the new earth. That is what we're looking forward to. That is our hope. So the gospel, the big story is really about alignment. And Christ came to this earth to get us back on track. Why? Because we have all done things that have caused our hearts and our minds to be misaligned. We've all swerved to the right and swerved to the left. We've placed ourselves and others in danger. We've made decisions that have separated us from God. Christ came to realign us with the Father, with God. So now we have an opportunity, we have a chance to walk in alignment with him. We never get it down perfectly. We're never gonna figure it out perfectly. But all of our life really is taking our life, our pain, our sorrows, our missteps, our stupidity, if you would, at times, and taking those to God and saying, God, I wanna align my life with you. I wanna confess my misalignments. I wanna confess my sin, my junk to you. And God, I wanna do better. I wanna live better. I wanna honor you. I wanna align my mind with your mind. I wanna align my heart with your heart. It's time to align. When we're walking in alignment, we have clarity. We have confidence and we have courage. Clarity, confidence, and courage when we're walking in alignment with God. And the great thing about God is God God is, God just keeps on pursuing us. Have you noticed that? God pursues us. God pursues us in a worship service. God pursues us by speaking to us at night when we're trying to go to sleep. God pursues us in our conscience and our regrets. Even in our emotions, when we feel like they're out of whack, he wakes us up and makes us realize, hey, 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 you need to realign your life. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we align our life? Here's some practical steps. You can write them down, put them in your phone or however you're taking notes. Or if you are a um, mental genius, you can memorize them, then memorize them. But let's look at uh, James chapter number five, verse 16. James 5, 16. James was a half brother of Jesus and James was all about actions, right? James is about actions. Oh yeah, you say you believe in God, show it, live it. Actions. Here's what James said. Here's an action we need to take to get in alignment with God again. He says, therefore, confess your sins, your misalignment to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So the first thing you need to do, the first step is to confess to a mechanic. I'm out of alignment. I don't need you. I don't mean you need to go to a literal mechanic, though maybe you do and it'll save your car and someone else's life. But hey, go to someone who's a mechanic of the soul, someone you can trust, another person, another human being, and look in the eye and say, listen, I have got an alignment problem. I'm out of alignment. Here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what I'm struggling with. And lay that out to that other person. You've made the internal decision. 
God has been speaking to you in the last few minutes here. I know that he has, but you've got to go and talk to another person to give you another level of accountability to make it real. So confess, go talk to a mechanic and tell them, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. The second thing you need to do is make the proper adjustments, okay? Make the proper adjustments. I don't know what your alignment issues are. You don't know what my alignment issues are, but you have alignment issues. Maybe it's at work, maybe it's, it's what you're eating, maybe it's what you're doing, maybe it's a habit and addiction. I don't know what it is, but you've gotta make the necessary adjustments to start living in alignment again. Third thing that you need to do is to schedule it out, right? You gotta write it down or put it in your task list, things to do, things to accomplish, Put it in your calendar. I don't know how you do it, but schedule it out. Say, hey, there, here's a time today, this Sunday or Monday or Tuesday, whenever you can schedule out and say, hey, here are some things I'm gonna do at this time to start walking back in alignment with God and his plans and purposes for my life. So schedule it out. Those are three practical things you can do, three steps you can do that will help you get back into alignment. One thing I've noticed one thing I notice, <laughs> whether you're driving a car or whether you're driving down the road of life, no one drifts back into alignment. I've never seen that. We have to make the choice, the choice to realign our life with God, to start walking in alignment where we say, God, not my will, but your will be done. It's time. It's time to align. And God will give us the power and the strength to do that. Isn't that great? Don't we serve and worship a great God who loves us so much that he won't allow us to live in misalignment.